take up the rest of the That feels like the right thing. I think we're we didn't all of it. We're going to have one Christmas service, which is not what you're asking. Well, no, we were just that talking about we that, too. To that. Is that going to be at 11 o'clock, <laughs> probably? 11 o'clock, yeah. 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 And every young. Yeah. Everyone's invited to bring a bag of toys. Yeah. Yeah. Give it, yeah, give it away. When I was I when I was a kid, I remember having two Xboxes. Oh, I loved them. And uh, yeah. uh, lawn darts. Lawn darts. That was yeah. fun. Yeah. You know. Ever yeah. felt? Yeah. Hey, kids. Ever wonder what it's like to put your life in yeah. hands yeah. or in dad's hands? Yeah. <laughs> what a great toy that was. Oh, I know. Until somebody got their eye stabbed right through their brain. Yeah. Then the rest of us were like, "Great, thanks. You ruined it for all of us." Yeah. That and slip and slide. We all like one. broke our ribs. We had a different Yes. Yes. Thing yes. That Welcome to worship. Welcome to those who are here in the first Methodist crowd. Welcome to those who are here in the second Methodist crowd, which is what they named the balcony some decades ago, Second Methodist Church. We, uh, we welcome you. If you're in the room, if you are watching online, if, uh, if, if, if you're watching online and listening and you're three blocks away and you're going to be here in a minute, you're, uh, you're welcome as well. We... Um, we believe that God has gifted us every day, and every, every day is a blessing and an opportunity, and that, and that Sundays have been set aside as, as, as significant because it's on Sunday that we retell the good news, the, the gospel truth that Jesus Christ, that, 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 that first Sunday morning, was, was found to have been raised from the dead, the tomb was empty, and that and that death does not have victory over us. And, and we gather as the people of God to, to retell that story, but also to, 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 to reset our lives back to the good news for the, for the week that is to come. And so I, I believe and I, and I hope that when we gather around the Word of God through the songs that we sing and the prayers that we offer and, and the Word that's proclaimed, that's what's happening in this hour. Well, I, I'd love for uh, members and visitors every single Sunday to, uh, to, to, to grab the Connect card that's... Uh, that's literally inside of your bulletin. You, uh, you take it, you, you, you tear it off like this. I, I, I want to hear the noise of the tearing. Um, Stephanie, uh, Stephanie had this idea a week ago, and she did it with the services that she was preaching in. Um, fill out the Connect card, and then down in the bottom, uh, do us a favor. Keep us up to date. We don't have, we don't have everybody's birth date. If you want to write your, your, your birth date, and, and if you just want to write month and, and, and day, that'd be fine. If you want to put the whole thing, it's, it's trusted, it's secure. We don't sell your information. But, um, but we'd love for you to do that. We've been writing uh, uh, birthday cards for a couple of months now, and we don't want to miss yours, and so um, just a way for our church to care for you. But that'd be great. And you drop these inside of the offering plate as it goes around uh, later on. As, you, uh, as, as many of you are aware, this is, uh, this is the week, whether it be tomorrow or Friday or, 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 or just a couple days after that for, uh, for, for this school or this school or, or Georgia Southern uh, it's, it's, it's the return to school. And we don't want, we don't want anyone in our church to miss some, some of these returning dates. So let me real quick mention that, that this Wednesday, August the 3rd at 6 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall, our student ministry is having our parent meeting um, where, uh, where, where parents of grades 6 through 12 are invited to get oriented to the, to the new semester, to the new year, to get dates on the calendar, to talk about how we do 
ministry together with our students. There's a, there's a confirmation meeting that happens immediately after that in the, welcome, uh, in the, in the, in the gathering area, and, uh, and, and Stephanie will be leading that. That, um, that happens just after the parents' meeting. So if you are the parent of someone that's going into sixth grade, if you're the parent of someone who, who hasn't been through confirmation, maybe like a seventh or an eighth grader, um, then you'd be welcome to be a part of that. It's going to be brief. Next Sunday is Promotion Sunday, so, so that's, when, uh, that's the first Sunday that, that the kids' worship uh, you, you know, grades change. It'll, uh, it'll still be for pre-K through third grade. Our nursery is for children before they start pre-K. And, um, and then, of course, a week from now, we've been talking about is August 10th is our kickoff event for Wednesday nights. We, um, we, it's something for folks of every age where we, uh, where we, where we turn to the, to the weekly rhythm. Of, 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 of a meal together and hearing a testimony and then, and then going our separate ways into different age groups and, and learning and growing together. I do want to note that, um, that next Sunday is the, uh, is the first Sunday of the month, so, so our church gathers around, around the, uh, the sacrament of Holy Communion, but we also invite you to bring food supplies that, that get donated to, uh, to our local food pantry, and, and that happens in the little red uh, carts and, and, and wagons in the narthex and back in the fellowship hall. For all that is happening in the world, this hour is a gift back to God. May our hearts be turned more in love with each other and with the God who loves us and made us. I invite you to join with me as we prepare our hearts for that as the music plays.
Good morning. Good morning. I'm Joe McLamory, a member of this congregation, and it's my honor this morning, on behalf of our entire Statesboro First United Methodist family, to welcome you to this 11 o'clock traditional worship service. It's our prayer that you will experience the mighty presence of the Lord here in this place today. I would add that if you're a visitor and if you're looking for a local church home, we hope you'll consider Statesboro first. We promise to do all in our power to make you feel welcome at home and to provide you and your family with a nurturing Christian environment. Our call to worship is printed in your order of worship. Please stand as you're able as we read together responsibly. We gather today to worship the one who created us, the one who calls us, the one who equips us, the one who loves us without end. With joyful hearts, let us worship God. Father, everything we need is found in you. For those of us who come here feeling broken, bring restoration. For those of us who come here feeling weak, bring strength. For those who come here weeping, bring joy. For those of us who come here with doubts, bring faith. For those who come here feeling shame, bring freedom. For those of us who come here feeling burdened, bring rest. For those of us who come here feeling anxious, bring peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Continue standing as you're able as we join in the hymns of praise medley this morning. We'll sing the first and last verses of number 378, Amazing Grace, as well as number 382, Have Thine Own Way, Lord.
Apostles' Creed is found in your hymnal at number 881. Would you remain standing as we join in this historic confession of the Christian faith? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and dead. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. At this time, our children in grades pre-K through third grade, not those who start those grades next year but have finished them, are invited to go with Jody Hendricks to Children's Church at this time. Everyone else is invited to get out of your pews and speak to every good-looking person around you right now. We've been praying for months now, each Sunday, for, uh, for the people of Ukraine. We, we add to our prayers the, the, our, our neighbors in Kentucky, devastated by floods. We, we turn on the news, and, and there's, there's, there's this group, and there's this place, and there's this person, and then there's this, 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 this thing. And as the people of God, our, our, our hearts are to respond in prayer and in action. And along with all of those places and people, we, we pray each week for our, some of our own. You've got names that, that are on this list. You uh, write them down on a connect card. We add them to the list. But it, what we, we're, we're praying for Linda Arnold and for Gene Deal, for John Gould and Edith Jenkins, Dot Piazza and Earl and Jewel Dabbs, Shirley Cannell and Gretchen Jackson and Betty Rushing, James Rushing and Jeanette Johnson, May Doherty, Bob and Gladys Hacker. We pray for Doug Duggan. That, 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 that 
that peace would happen, that healing would come, that God's will would be achieved. As much as is possible on, on, on this side of heaven. But surely, but surely in heaven as well. And we pray for those who, uh, who are about the work of God. Healthcare workers and first responders. We, we pray that our nation's military would, 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 would win in the battle for freedom. We pay, pray for, for elected leaders at every level of government. That they would be about the will of God as they serve. I invite you to join with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, our prayer is for your will to be done, for your victory to be established and for your people and for all people to have faith in the, in the, in the truth of your love, of your power, of your conquering history. Lord, help us to be a people whose faith would be put on display that others would take notice. Help us to be a people whose actions would be about your agenda of putting the world back together. Lord, for the names that we've lifted up, Lord, we pause over them. Praying that your will would be done. And we do so praying in the name of your son, Jesus. Even now, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Accept now these the gifts of thy people, and may the purposes for which they are intended prosper through thy guidance. Amen.
want to start serious for a change and say uh, that I've been a part of some conversations and, 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 a, and a portion of you, I don't, I don't presume to think it's all of you, but a, but, but a portion of you have been a part of conversations or, or at least aware of conversations that, uh, that, that vary in between uh, talking about our local church and then the denomination that our local church has been a part of for oh, 54 years now, the United Methodist Church. And, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be a part uh, and, and, and to have a hand in, um, in, in, a, in a communication plan, an education plan that, that's coming out in the next couple of weeks and that we're going to talk about and, that, and that, that the whole congregation will have access to. We've been, we've been talking about this now, Stephanie and I have for a, for a few months, but, but we want the whole congregation to be a part of it. And, it, and, it, and it's, related to, uh, it's related to controversy. It's related to, uh, to conflict. It's related to, to rules and those who are, who are following and not following the rules. And, that's, and that, that, that's, all, uh, that's all a part of the story of the denomination. And we want to tell states for a first part in all of that. And, and it'll be good to do that. That's the serious part. The playful part is to shift gears entirely and talk about another ongoing controversy, shall I say disagreement, shall I say just flat out arguing that I'm having with one person in particular. And, and the awkward part is, Jackson, John Ray wasn't in the nine o'clock service when I was talking about him. He's literally sitting like five rows from me right now, but I'm gonna call him by name. John Ray and I are in an argument. For those who missed that earlier clue, this is playful, everybody? Everybody say, we got you, Scott. You with me? Okay, all right, good. Because two or three of y'all are like, what kind of church is this? All right, John Ray and I are in an argument. <clears throat> and it goes back to about five weeks ago, it was five or six weeks ago, when I mentioned that Julie and I were going to get to go to Maine. And you were like, Maine? Well, Maine has some of the most scenic, panoramic, beautiful works of God that you'll ever see in these continental United States, and you've been around the world serving your country, and so, so you've seen a lot. You're like, Maine and Acadia National Park is it. It's the be-all, end-all. You're going to be blown away, and I'm like, I can't wait to go see it, and we went to see it, and it's incredible. We hiked here and hiked there and drove here and saw sunsets. It was awesome. And we don't believe in screens in the sanctuary, so hear me, right, right, that's not the controversy. But if there were a screen, I could show you a photo I have, it's on my phone, it, a photo I have of, um, of, a, of a panoramic view with these um, just gorgeous green trees, and then there's a beach way down below, and then there's, there's more mountains, and, and, and further in the background, there's a little, there's little egg rock island that has a lighthouse on it, and it's, it's got the coast, and, and it's got the mountains, and it's incredible. And John Ray believes... Am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He believes that it's, it's maybe one of the most beautiful places he's seen. And I think that he's close, but he's not right. You see, because I've been to Yosemite Valley, and I got a photo of that. And I don't know, I've been to both now. Acadia is amazing, but I don't know that you can beat Half Dome and El Capitan and then, and then this, 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 this flat valley in between with a little stream running through it that has just perfect pebbles in it and, 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 and the rocks come straight up out of the side and, and, and on the one hand I'm being playful but on the other hand I'm actually not being playful because there is something about my human nature, there's something about his there's something about all of ours, you ready for this? that that marvels at that which is impressive. There's something in us that, 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 that keeps up with, that pays attention to the stuff that impresses us. And so, so when, I, when, I, when, when I see this view or I see this view or someone's talking to me about this or that, I'm, 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 I'm blown away. I'm impressed. There's something about us that literally turns on inside of us and says, man, that was impressive and I want to tell you about it. Which, which, is, which, is, which is literally what the scripture is about. The scripture this morning is about Jesus being impressed. 
And I'll go ahead, I'll go ahead and tell you the end of the sermon right now. Now, we got, we got a few more minutes, but I'm going to tell you the end of the sermon right now, which is I believe that at the end of my life, I am called to live in such a way that Jesus has been impressed with how I live. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm quoting the Bible. I'm not, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about appearances. I'm not talking about, about something fake. I'm not talking about something temporary. That there's something about our lives that God is taking stock of, that Jesus is paying attention to. And, and I want to live a life with such a faith that, that at the end of it all, God stands in front of me and says, hey, hey, you got all these things wrong. And then he turns the page, and these things wrong. You with me? And he turns the page, and these things wrong. I mean, it's a long list of things I've gotten wrong. But, but faith in Christ, Scott, it gets you in. So, so turn with me in, in the Bible to Matthew chapter 8. It's where, we, it's where we start today, Matthew chapter 8. I, uh, I'll mention to you that Matthew chapter 8 comes after Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And some of you think I'm joking, but it actually is significant. Matthew, Matthew chapter 8 comes after 5, 6, and 7 because, because it's in 5, 6, and 7 that Jesus has, in Matthew's telling of the story, offered up what is, what is possibly the most significant, maybe in all of the Bible, it's, 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 some of the, it's some of the most compact and powerful and memorable teaching that he's ever done. Matthew takes the story of Jesus, you've heard me say this before, and he, and he takes it apart, and he slides in a teaching here, and he slides in a teaching there, and he does it five different times. Five different teachings, five different discourses, and Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 is the first of those. You know it is the Sermon on the Mount. And the reason I know that, that 8 is significant in comparison to 5, 6, and 7 is the very first verse. It says, now when Jesus had come down from the mountain, come down from, 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 from the hillside with this, this giant sloping, it looks, like, it looks like a scene from The Sound of Music or a Little House on the Prairie, and just, just the hill goes on and on and on if you've had the chance to go there. And the Sea of Galilee is below it, and there's a, there's a little village right over here. It says, it, 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 it says that Jesus had taught there, and there were crowds listening to him, and he had put on display the, the, his, his, his knowledge and his command of the law of God and the truth of God. And he compared and contrasted some with, with those who interpret it differently, maybe more harshly, maybe, maybe too narrow. It says, when Jesus had come down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. A man with a skin disease, known as, known as leprosy, kneeled before him and said, Lord, if you want, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched him, saying, I do want to become clean. Instantly, his skin disease was cleansed. Jesus said to him, don't say anything to anyone. Instead, go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded. This will be a testimony to them. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll pause here to say that, 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 that Jesus believes that this man's witness matters. He's been healed. But he says, now, now, before you go off and do this, this, or this, before you often go off and say this, this, and this, you, it, it matters that you keep the commandments and go and offer the, 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 the thanksgiving offering at the temple. Because if you do it that way, there'll be some who pay attention and their lives will be changed by your witness to what you've received. And then in verse 5 it says, when Jesus went to Capernaum, this is the little village that's just over, just over from, from the, the, the big grassy hillside where, where the church now for a couple thousand years has believed the Sermon on the Mount happened. It says, a centurion approached. Now, now everyone that was watching this happen, everyone that, that, read, that read the later account of, of, 
of Matthew, when his letters got passed around to the churches, everyone would have known immediately who a centurion was and what that meant. A centurion was, a, was an employee of the emperor. He was an officer of Caesar. And his name was derived from the fact that, that, that he was an officer of enough, enough rank that, that around 100 soldiers were under his command. I've read it was 80 to 100, it fluctuated depending on how recruiting was going at the time, what kind of wars they were in, what kind of casualties they'd suffered, 80 to 100. And he'd achieved enough rank that, 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 that up to 100 men were listening to him. So this is centurion, but, he, but let me say, he was, he was in the Roman army, he would not have been a Jew. The centurion approaches Jesus, pleading with him, and his words are, Lord, my servant is flat on his back at home, paralyzed, and his suffering is awful. Jesus responded, I'll come and heal him. And if you don't read another word, really, that, that should be the end of this story. If you don't read another word, hear me, this, 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 uh, this, this, this centurion comes and says, Jesus, I'm here on behalf of someone else who has a problem. And in between the lines, and I have a belief that you can fix this person's problem. That's what happens. And then Jesus responds, I'll come and heal him. And that should be it. But that's not the end. In fact, in fact the gospel story takes a hard right turn. Says the centurion replied, Lord, stand still. Hold on. Hold your horses. Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. I'm a man under authority with soldiers under me. So he's just described three levels or three generations of authority above him, himself, and those under him. He says, he says, I say to one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and the servant does it. When Jesus heard this, he was impressed. And he turned to the people that were following him, and he said, I say to you with all seriousness that even in Israel, I haven't found faith like this. And then you read on. I say to you that there are many who will come from the east and the west and sit down to eat with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom, which is best interpreted to be, to be those who were born with Jewish bloodlines, right? They, they will be thrown outside into the darkness. People there will be weeping and grinding their teeth. Jesus said to the centurion, go, it will be done for you just as you have believed. And his servant was healed that very moment. This is the word of God for we, the people of God, and we say together, thanks be to God. I, uh, I've been knocking around with, with my notes this morning because I, I really have more of a, of a, I have more of a set of notes for like a Bible study than I do for a sermon. So in just a few moments, let me just, let me just say some things, Right? We're going to go somewhere, but I'm, let me just say some things. First, first of all, that, that what's fascinating is that, is that after three chapters of teaching the Jewish people of God about the Jewish commandments of God, right, so that they would, that they would one day realize the, the, the Jewish uh, 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 promises of God, which, which are a Messiah that comes to reconcile things and put things back together, that, after three chapters of talking to Jews about Jewish things and Jewish hopes and dreams, the very next two stories have as, as the recipients of the goodness to be outsiders and not Jews. I mean, like, like you, you, I was going to say, you don't get much more outsider than a leper. 
Because it's the Jewish laws that say if you have a skin disease that they would have called universally lep leprosy, if you have that, then you have to be isolated, you cannot participate in worship, you can't have to be cut off from community, and anybody that touches you, note that, anybody that touches you is violating the law of God. That's in the Scriptures. And yet, yet that's the first recipient of the miracle story following the Sermon on the Mount. And then the second one, is even more of an outsider. He's literally from a different place, from a different worldview. He has a different employer. He's the oppressor. So it's fascinating that the first two stories to the crowd are about outsiders. But, but, he, but even more dis, dis, disjointed in the in, 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 the, in the divine way is that Jesus takes the two healing stories and says at the end of them, in the last three verses we just read, that, that these two healing stories actually are like a window into heaven. And you're like, Scott, he didn't say one such thing, but he did though. Listen, when you get to verse 11, he says, I say to you that there are many who will come from the east and the west. He's talking about the outsiders. He's talking about, he's talking about foreigners. He's talking about people who aren't in the bloodline. And they will sit down to eat with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And everyone in his initial audience would have immediately known he was talking about, he was talking about the end of the world. He was talking about the events after the judgment day. He's talking about, he's talking about the, 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 the culmination of God's history. Because it was widely taught both, both in the Old Testament and then later on in the Gospels by Jesus himself that heaven is to be understood like a banquet table. A banquet table. So, so you've heard, heaven is a big old party. It literally, in the Bible says that. It's a giant party. It's like, it's like the wedding. With, 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 with the greatest band you've ever heard. And an abundance of food that never runs out. And Jesus says that this outsider, because of something about him that impressed Jesus, but that this outsider is, is, is going to be included at the table. For that matter, he's going to be sitting elbow to elbow with three of the greatest in the faith ever. You've heard me say before that when, um, that when the four Hagans have a meal together, every other meal we have includes a part of a conversation in which we are discussing the greatest person in this category ever or this one, right? Right? Lately, it's been, you know, like, like, like who, who, who's, the, who's, the, who's, who's the greatest baseball player? Just, just the other day, it was like, who's the greatest shortstop of all time? One of the frequent ones is, who's the greatest basketball player of all time, right? I mean, and it's Michael Jordan, unless, unless you think it's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was pretty great. And it's definitely not my son's choice in Kobe Bryant. He's great, but he's not, he's not the greatest, and it's not LeBron James. But if you were a Jewish teenager, or if you were a Jewish father who was trying to connect with his teenagers, you with me? And you talked about who was the greatest of all time in the Jewish faith. Well, you could have said it was Jacob. You could have said it was Isaac. You could have said it was Abraham. And Jesus says those greats of all time are going to have people sitting around them in heaven that will shock you. And he says, this guy is in because of something that impresses me. So, 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 so we're ready to land the plane, but, but we got to ask, what was it that impressed Jesus? What was it impressed, that impressed Jesus enough that Matthew would remember it? that he would retell the story, that he'd give it to us. And I, I don't know, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe, there's, maybe there's three lists over here. Maybe there's the no way it's not this list. Maybe there's the maybe it's this list. And maybe there's the absolutely it's this list. It's, okay, it's definitely not that Jesus was impressed by his power. 
right? It's definitely not that he was impressed by his rank, right? It's, it's definitely not that he was impressed that he traveled a long way. Maybe he was impressed by his humility. Maybe he was impressed by his selflessness. I mean, here, here he comes and says, hey, I want you to heal this person, and it's not me. Maybe he's impressed by some of those characteristics, but, but at the end of the day, I think what was different about the centurion that makes this impressive list for Jesus is not just that he had an understanding of the power of Jesus, but he had a confidence ask for it. And further, a confidence to say, hey, you don't have to go anywhere. You can say the word, and I know it'll happen. And when I think about the church today, and what we are supposed to be about, Matthew 28, we, 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 the, the, the the Great Commission. It's, it's the mission of the church. We are supposed to be about making disciples. The United Methodist Church added for the transformation of the world, which is, which is pretty good. We're supposed to be making disciples who are, who are changing the world for the kingdom of heaven, who are changing the world through our faith, through our witness. We're supposed to be making disciples. And I, and I believe we do that. But, but I'm not sure how many of us have the kind of confidence that this centurion had? And I believe this story is told because we're supposed to. I believe we're supposed to have a confidence that says, not only do I understand but I put it into practice. A couple weeks ago, we preached about Judas. And I, and I said, I don't know for certain what his motivations were, but it, but it might have been, it seems to be from the Bible, that he believed Jesus was the Messiah. He just didn't trust Jesus. So to say, which is to say, he, he, he got his understanding right, he got his knowledge right, but, but, he, but, he, but he messed up, right? He, but, he, but he messed up on, on, on the trusting of God. You can be right and be all wrong. I don't want any of us to have faith that we can't use because we don't have confidence in it. And I was, I was, I was telling Stephanie this week that, that I, I, want, I want to say this playfully, but, but the first time I tried this morning, I, I couldn't, it didn't come out playful, I'll be honest. I want to say this playfully. There are people in our church who... Who, who said the words, who did the thing, who believe in Jesus. They've got the faith. But if you see them out in public and they were to get, to, they were to get asked to say a prayer in front of other people, what, what does it mean to be a Christian and not have the confidence to say a prayer in public. And I get it. But I don't think Jesus thinks it's impressive. But I, but I point the finger back this way. What, what's it mean to be the leader of a church that's developing faith but, but leaving out the confidence. I believe this story is in here because Jesus, long before, long before they get to the end, long before it gets really hard, long before the world comes and presses in and the devil is just wearing them out, long before any of that, Jesus knows in advance that, that to have faith requires confidence to put it on display in the world because our witness matters. I want our church, 
You want our church to be a, a place that teaches and then expects this kind of confidence when we leave this place. Because, because heaven knows that disciples, that, 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 that followers of Jesus need big, confident faith to go and live in the world. It's not enough to, to understand. It's, it's not enough to know. If, if, if when you need to, you, you can't do it. And it, Praying in public, that's, that's one thing. What, what about telling your story in public? What about, what about stopping and asking this guy what he needs and Asking this woman how you can help. What, what, about, what, about, what about stopping this and adding this? What about changing this? All because of a faith that says with confidence, the Holy Spirit is leading me to live out there the stuff that I, that I know I believe in here. I, I, I want, not in a worldly way, goodness gracious, no, I, I want at the end of the day to Jesus, for Jesus to look at us and say, the faith you have in me will it impress others and they believed because of you. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, move faith past the head that can remember this and understands this and believes this and, and get it Get our faith down into our heart. With a confidence that frees us from the, from the overthinking, from any of the obstacles that have, that have previously held us back. Lord, we want to live with a kind of confidence that blesses you and causes heaven to take notice. We pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. these two hymns to close us out from 381 the first and fourth verses from 374 the same I invite you to stand as we sing together Savior like a shepherd lead us and then standing on the promises
his greatest promise? Oh, his love, his grace, his mercy. But, but at the end of Matthew's gospel, his promise is his presence. And lo, I will be with you always. We go forth with faith that has a confidence because Christ is with us when we go. May that be grace and peace and Jesus for you this day. Amen.